Hey y'all, Prophet David Taylor here. I know this is Thursday night. Okay, so I'm going to explain that to you. Let me get my Periscope audience in. Uh, so hopefully uh, it always takes a second uh, for my camera to flip to be sure they can uh, see me and not whatever else my camera's looking at. There we go. Hello Periscope audience. All right. So I know this is Thursday night. I'm starting something on second Thursday night. I'm going to start a night of teaching and miracles and healings. Okay? So uh, before I do that, oh, notice the first part of it was teaching. There's a lot of teaching I have to do. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to stop my Sunday broadcast. I'm still going to come on every Sunday at 2.30 uh, p.m. Central Standard Time. But I'm also going to come on uh, once a month on Blessings to You. Once a month on the second Thursday of every month at 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time like I am now. So 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time like I am now on the second Thursday of every month I'll be doing more teaching and uh, we'll be talking about miracles and healings and uh, so many of the things, so many of the blessings, so many things you want to walk in. Uh, we're going to be learning how to and actually walking in that and then I'm going to have ask some of y'all to send in your testimony. Okay? But the first part about it is teaching. Now, um, you may have noticed the hashtags, the hashtag PDT, that stands for me, Prophet David Taylor, and then the hashtag NMG, okay? That stands for No More Genies, okay? I talked about this on Sunday afternoon. One of the, the biggest uh, troublemakers, one of the biggest points of aggravation, one of the biggest things that has hurt the body of Christ is something I call genie concept. Okay, and so many people have a genie concept of God, and they have a genie concept of life, and they have a genie concept of the kingdom of God, and it has cost us plenty. Some people it cost them their health, some people it cost them their marriage, some people it cost them their reputation, some people it cost them the lives of their children. Do you know why? Because as a concept, it's wrong. And it's, it's one of those, one of those uh, it's partly demonic. And so we're going to do some deliverance. And then some of it is just wrong thinking. Okay, so it's both a spirit and a mindset. We can cast out the spirit, but even when you cast out a spirit, you've got to change your mind. You've got to fill that house back up with right teaching and right thinking. And again, genie concept has been very expensive to many Christians. Some people have let their children die. Again, lost their marriages, lost their reputations, lost so much because of genie concept. Because you got the wrong idea about God and you got the wrong idea about the kingdom of God. So my hashtags that you find uh, on these teachings that is going to be on second Thursday night, PDT, that stands for me, Prophet David Taylor, and NMG, no more genies. Okay, no more genie concept. Now, uh, I'm going to deal with a phrase called fallow ground. Our scripture reference for that is Hosea 10 and 12. Hosea 10 and 12 says, it's the King James Version, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Wow, that verse is full. I wish I had time to exegete all of it, but I just want to focus on fallow ground. Okay? You, uh, that's kind of a, uh, uh, it's obviously a scriptural phrase, but sometimes that's a bit of an old school phrase you might hear in older Protestant churches. Okay, so the phrase in the NIV says unplowed ground. In the King James Version, it says fallow ground. It's the Hebrew ground, near, and it means the tillable, untilled, or fallowed ground. What that means is that it's land that could be productive, but it hasn't been broken up, it hasn't been plowed, it hasn't been prepared to be productive. The reason I'm talking about that is because this is talking about the teaching part. The reason that we have to do teaching first is because we have fallow ground sometimes in our heart and in our minds. We have ground in our heart that is still crusted over, still full of weeds, rocks, uh, things that need to be uprooted. Okay? So, for example, uh, bitterness. If you're still walking in bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, toxic anger, unforgiveness, things like that, those things begin to fester and take root in your heart. They cloud the heart and they cloud the mind. 
And God can't plant the seeds he wants to plant when your heart and your mind are all clouded up, all messed up, all full of wrong things. Thorns, thistles, right? Somebody said thicket, right? Well, those things can take place in your heart and your mind, okay? They can take root in your heart and your mind. It's very easy for them to do so. So God has to come in with his word and with his spirit and begin to break up those wrong feelings, those wrong perspectives, those wrong beliefs, cast out the demons, cast out the unclean spirits, cast out any spirit that you've accepted that's not from God, that's now operating through your life, and teach you how to renew your mind, to make your thoughts new. That is so important. That's why I start with it every time. You have to start there. You can't just jump into teaching. You can't just jump into principles. You can't just jump into stuff. You've got to deal with your heart and your mind. Okay? So God is going to come in with his word and with his spirit and begin to take out those things that are not like him, those things that may have built up over the years. You might be carrying forgiveness for, for a long time ago. You might have been hurt and you never got the healing. Uh, one, of, one of the deeper things to hurt from is when you've been wronged and you know that the other person was wrong but you never felt like you got a sense of justice or closure, that's really hard. Another one is uh, rejection or abuse by parents. That's really deep. Stuff like that. That's the kind of stuff that begins to make you cynical and make you negative and make you pessimistic and make you stop believing for good things in life. Stop hoping for good things. Stop believing God. And once you stop believing, it's not going to manifest in your life, and I'm going to get into that in a minute. But that's why I always start here we got to start with fallow ground. We have to go through and break up those wrong thoughts, wrong ideas, wrong concepts, and get the right stuff in so that God can move the way he wants to. Okay? So, let's begin by defining our term. When I say genie concept, what do I mean? I mean, quite simply, magic. If you think something is magic, if you think God is magic, if you think his kingdom is magic, you think that it's unexplainable, you think that it's unpredictable, and you think it only works for certain people. Okay, that's a clear sign you've got genie concept, <laughs> because none of that is true. None of that is true about God, and none of that is true about his kingdom. But if you think it's magic, if you think it's something you can't explain, it just happens. If you think it's unpredictable, we don't know, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. And if you think, well, you know, it only happens for certain people. You know, I'm not one of those lucky people. I'm not one of the fortunate ones that gets that. You know, I don't get that in life. All that is wrong. It's not magic. God is not a genie. And his kingdom is not magic. Okay? So we have to get that out. He's the same yesterday and today and forever, man. We got to get that out. We got to get the right stuff in. So that's what I mean when I say genie concept. I'm talking about magic where you believe it is unexplainable, unpredictable, and only works for certain people. Okay? Where did genie concept come from? All right. Genie concept started in the Garden of Eden. And we can find it in Genesis chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. And I'm going to be reading that. Okay? Out of the New American Standard Bible. Genesis, the first book in the Bible, chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. This is Eve talking at first. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. That's Eve talking to the snake. Verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. In the King James that says, King James it says, ye shall not surely die. Okay, that is where genie concept started. What did the devil say to Eve? Okay, the devil said to Eve that she could make a choice and not get a consequence. That's not true. You can never make a choice and not get a consequence. Every word you say, every piece of food you put in your mouth, every place that you go, everything you expose your eyes or your ears to has an impact. But the devil told Eve she could make a choice and not get a consequence. Okay? Part one. Part two, the devil told Eve she could choose death and not get death. So God said, if you eat the fruit of that tree, you're going to die. 
The devil said, you're not going to die. You're surely not going to die. Okay? And Eve believed him. Eve bought it. Eve believed what the devil said. Eve believed she could make a choice and not get a consequence. Eve believed that she could choose death and not get death. And then she ate that fruit. That's how it got into the human system. That's where it comes from. The devil told the woman she could make a choice and not get a consequence, and she believed it. The devil told the woman she could choose death, because God had already told Adam. Because Adam is the one that taught Eve, because Eve wasn't there when God gave the commandment. God gave the commandment to Adam. So her husband had to have taught her what God said, and she quoted what they said, that if you eat the tree in the middle of the garden, that you're going to die. Then the devil said, you're not going to die. He said, you're surely not going to die. Ye shall not surely die. And Eve believed it. And then she ate that fruit. So she believed you could make a choice and not get a consequence. And she believed that you could choose death and not get death. That's the beginning of genie concept. That's where it started. That's where we started believing in magic. Where we can make choices and not reap a harvest. And where we could choose death and not get death. That comes straight from the devil. Okay, that whole magical thing, like I stuck my hand in boiling oil, why is my hand burnt, I don't understand. I stuck my hand on the stove, why is my hand burnt, I don't understand. Because you made a choice. Okay, remind me uh, at the end of our program, I'll give you word on your VA benefits. I see you. Remind me at the end of the program. Uh, uh, the devil told the woman that, that she could make a choice and not to get a consequence, that she could choose death and not get death. That was the beginning of us believing that there was such a thing as magic. The things just happened, they're unexplainable, unpredictable. I don't know what happened, like there weren't any choices and consequences involved. That's where it started. That's the beginning of Genie Concept, but Genie Concept grew from there. It became some other things, and I'm going to show you that now, too. Okay? The first thing I want to show you is the actual truth about getting things in life. Getting things in life has a minimum of three costs, okay? If you want something in life, whatever you want. See, now, when you imagine something in life, you tend to imagine the things you like about it. You tend to imagine it in its perfect form for you, and you tend to imagine and get excited about the things that you like. You will discover <laughs> that if and when you are to get that thing, you have to take everything that comes along with it. And that's where the costs come in. And here they are. There's three costs. Okay. This is the truth to counter what the devil told Eve. The truth in life is, number one, you have to pay a cost to attain something. If you want to attain, for example, a college degree, or you want to build a marriage, or you want to raise a child, or you want to lose some weight and get a healthy body. Or you want to grow in faith in your walk with God. Or you want to build a financial portfolio. Or you want to start a new career, a new vocation. Whatever it is you want in life, it's going to cost you something to attain it. Okay? It's going to come with a cost. It's going to cost you something to attain it. They're not just going to hand you the degree. Okay? You're not just going to wake up and have a good marriage. That's magical thinking. See, you just thought that once you got married, it was just going to happen. It's going to cost you something to attain a good marriage. Okay, so first cost is uh, you got to pay to attain it. Second cost is the maintenance cost. You got to pay to maintain it. What does that mean? That means you have to pay to take care of it. Okay, I know that we wish things were self-maintaining, but there's nothing in your life that maintains itself. Think about it. Not your car, not your dog, not your health, not your money, not your relationships, there's not your mind. There's not one single thing that is self-maintaining. You got to pay some maintenance costs. You got to take care of that dog. You got to take care of your mind. You got to watch what you feed it. You got to use it or lose it. You got to take care of that car. You got to take care of that marriage. You have to pay some attention to your child. You can't just have a good relationship with your child because you want one. There's a maintenance cost. You have to maintain that relationship. Okay, so cost number one is attaining. There's a cost to attain. Cost number two is maintaining. Cost to take care of it. Cost number three is retain or retention cost. That's different from a maintenance cost. Why is that different? I'll tell you why. 
Because if there is anything in life of value, there is somebody somewhere that makes it their business to do nothing but figure out ways to take it from you. Even if it just has sentimental value. If you have anything of value in your life, just think about it. If you got a nice smile, somebody want to slap you in the mouth just to measure your teeth up. <laughs> if you have a good marital relationship, there are people around you right now that are swimming like sharks in the water, that are just waiting for a chance to take that good marriage from you. If you have a, a, a good child, a beautiful child, a, a positive child, a child that's doing nice things, then you need to retain that goodness in your child by protecting them and defending them and keeping those friends of theirs that are trying to tear them down away from them because I promise you, no matter what you have, your house, your car, any kind of money, uh, a watch, anything, uh, look at you know all the stuff we're going through now with our privacy and our data online. Look at that because it has value. So somebody somewhere is figuring out a way to try and take it from you all the time. Okay, that's the truth about life, not what the devil said. That you can make a choice and get it and not get a consequence. That's not true. That you can choose death and not get death. That's not true. What is true is that if you want anything in life, it's going to cost you something to attain it. It's going to cost you something to maintain it. And it's going to cost you something to retain it. It is not magic. Okay, so. That's uh, point number one. Now, uh, so uh, what I just told you about, uh, choice without consequence and choosing death and not get death, is something that we call price-free living. Lord have mercy, we want price-free living. We want price-free living so badly. We want it so badly. We want to have things at no cost. And that, again, came from that word, that scripture I read for you, Genesis 3, 3 and 4, in the Garden of Eden, where, where Eve believed what the devil said and ate that fruit and got that in our system. That we could somehow have price-free living. We want it so badly. We want it so badly. We want it so badly. That's what affairs are about. When people have affairs, you know what people are doing when they have affairs? They're saying, I want the pleasure of a relationship without the responsibility. The responsibilities of my marriage have gotten very heavy, and I don't like it. So let me go over here and get me somebody on the side where I could just have the pleasure of them without the responsibility, and that's a lie. That's another lie from the devil. That is incorrect. Because having affairs, living in adultery, come with costs. They produce death. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, uh, we're talking about genie concept, defined as magic, unexplainable, unpredictable, only works for certain people. Where did it come from? Genesis 3, 3, and 4, uh, where the devil first introduced the concept of getting a choice and not a consequence, choosing death and not getting death. So, uh, point number one is that we love price-free living. There is no such thing as price-free living. That's a lie. But whatever you want in life is going to cost you. It's going to cost you to attain, maintain, and retain. Okay? Next, a form of genie concept is something for nothing. <laughs> what is something for nothing? Something for nothing is where you believe you have to put forth no effort at all, and you're going to get a result. You're going to get a harvest. You have no effort at all putting out and you're going to get some kind of harvest back. That's something for nothing. Mm -hmm. That's another one we believe in very, very deeply. It's something for nothing. Okay? We're always running around on the highway of life trying to find stuff where it looks like, uh, you know, there's no effort on my part, but I'm going to get some kind of harvest out. I'm going to get something back out of it, but I didn't put nothing into it. Okay? That's another form of genie concept. Okay, so genie concept uh, takes many forms. Genie concept is magic. It's price-free living. Uh, it's something for nothing. There's no such thing as something for nothing. Okay, um, and that's how uh, we, we get in these situations and we get angry because we really thought we were going to reap a harvest with no effort. Okay, 
That's like going into your backyard and reaching over to your ground and saying to your ground, give me some tomatoes. Give me some tomatoes. And the neighbors are going to walk by and say, is that, is that Mr. Taylor in his backyard yelling at the ground? Don't he come out here every night and yell at the ground talking about give me some tomatoes? He, you know, kind of, mm-hmm. If you go in your backyard and you yell at your ground, give me some tomatoes, the ground just going to smile at you. The ground's going to say, don't bring me your knee, bring me some seed. <laughs> okay? Because there's no such thing as something for nothing. No such thing as you getting something back and you didn't put any, hey there, Sister Pat, <laughs> tomatoes please. <laughs> There's no such thing as you uh, didn't put any effort in and you get uh, something back. Okay? So again, uh, so price free living, genie concept. Something for nothing, genie concept. Generally the idea of magic, genie concept. All right? Let me give you another form of genie concept. It's called the free lunch. The free lunch is not the same as something for nothing. Something for nothing is where you feel like you don't have to do anything and you get a harvest. The free lunch is where somebody else has prepared something and you think they're going to give it to you for free. Oh, Lord. <laughs> so something for nothing is you not putting forth any effort and you think you're going to get a harvest. But the free lunch is where you think somebody's taking all the time to prepare all this food and cook all this food and get this beautiful lunch together and all this table spread and all the hors d'oeuvres and all the condiments and all the meats and the proteins and all that different kind of stuff. And they just go and give it to you. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Haven't we found that out when we sign up for free things online? If they're not charging, you're the product. <laughs> if they say sign up for free, that's so you're the product. <laughs> okay? Because there is no such thing as a free lunch. There is no such thing where somebody's going to go through all the trouble to prepare something, to prepare a table, to, to create something, anything of value, to prepare resources, and then just give it to you and ain't no cost. They might tell you that, but that's not the truth. That's how many of us have gotten into situations that we've had to pray our way out of, that we've had to fight our way out of, because you really thought you could go over there and there wasn't going to be a cost. Again, to use uh, the adultery example, uh, uh, adultery, again, is something where you kind of think that's a free lunch where you get the pleasure of someone, but you don't get the responsibility of them. That's not true. You can't do that. Life does not work that way. Okay? So if somebody makes you believe that all they want to do is give you pleasure on the side and they know you're married and that's going to be the end of it, oh, Lord, that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. Going to be some costs coming up later. Okay? All right. So let me give you another form of genie concept. Another form of genie concept is something I call uh, Lilo. Okay? Lilo. L-I-L-O. Okay? Lilo stands for little in, lot out. Okay? Now, Lilo is not the same as something for nothing, because something for nothing is no effort on your part. It's not the same as the free lunch, because the free lunch is effort on somebody else's part that you think they're just going to give you. Um, okay, Ralph, we'll pray for you at the end of the broadcast. Just remind me. And then uh, Lilo stands for little in, little out. What does that mean? That means just what it sounds like. It means you put a little bit in, but you expect this huge harvest. Okay? Let me give you an example of that in life. Now, church people are going to know what I'm talking about when I say this. Okay? Uh, I always like to explain my terms. Sometimes you might think I'm over-explaining. But I know that uh, every culture has its own language. And when you hang around that culture a lot, you adopt the phraseology, and then you begin to use it, and you just think that everybody knows what you're talking about. But everybody doesn't uh, have a church background. Everybody doesn't have the same kind of church background, so everybody doesn't know what everything means. So that's why I explain a lot when I teach, because I want to be sure that everyone's on the same page, that you understand what I'm talking about. Okay? So when I'm talking about Lilo, little in, little out, those are people we call CMEs. <laughs> CMEs are Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. They come to the house of God three times a year. Three times a year. They come on Christmas. 
They come on Mother's Day and they come on Easter, Resurrection Day, and they act like they're doing God a favor. Because they don't walk in, they strut in. Got on they white, got on they big hat. They strutting in because I'm up in here. Because <laughs> they are seeing me. And every time they come to the house of God, they put $5 in the offering plate. That's $15 a year. They done sold $15 a year into the house of God. That doesn't even cover your tithes. Tithes are 10% off the top out of every dollar you make. Every dollar you make that's increased to you, you're supposed to take a dime off the top of that dollar and sow it back into the house of God. That's called tithing. That's, that's what tithes are. And the word tithe actually means tenth. So for every dollar you make out of your paycheck, let's say you make $200 this week, you're supposed to take $20 off the top. Not when you get through paying all the bills. You don't give God the leftovers. You give God $20 off the top. March yourself to the house of God and sow that into the house of God to thank God for blessing you with a job, with your increase, and for the ability to hear his word. Okay? But if you only give God $15 a year, that means you only made $150. <laughs> and ain't no way in the world you only made $150 in a year. Especially if you've got the new clothes on, you know, because you come in strutting because you were seeing me Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter, and you put $5, and then when you feel magnanimous, one of them Sundays you might give God a 10 spot. Ooh. So you gave God $20 a year. <laughs> and in return for your three magnificent appearances, and in return for your $15 to $20, you think God going to rain a million dollar harvest down in your life. Those are the people that say things like, I tried that Jesus stuff, it don't work. I tried going to church, but it don't work. I tried that God stuff, but, but that ain't real. Those are the people that say stuff like that. You know why? Because they are strong in genie concept. They believe in a little bit in and a lot out. Okay? It does not work that way. God is a person, not a set of rules. Okay? God is a person where you want to have a relationship. I'll get to there. I'll get to that in a minute. That's my next topic. But I want to finish, finish up with Lilo. Okay? So if you think you can just put a little bit in and reap a lot out, that's not true of anything. If you want to play a musical instrument, you've got to spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours over the course of years mastering that instrument. If you want to ice skate on an Olympic level, you've got to spend hours and hours and hours. If you want to do gymnastics on an Olympic level, you've got to go hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, okay, to try and get to the level of mastery that you want to get to. You understand? You can't put a little in and get a lot out. That's genie concept, okay? And that's what messes a lot of people up because they thought they could just throw God their leftovers. They thought they could just come to the house of God three times a year. They thought they could not pay their tithes but give God, you know, a little leftover, just throw him the leftovers, throw him the, 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 the leftovers, the, the, the extra, you know, the, the, after you've done everything you wanted to do, and you look and you got a few dollars left over, you throw that to God? Mm-mm. 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 No, God does not honor that. It doesn't work that way. But see, that's little in, little out. And people that think like that are strong in genie concept. Okay? Now, let's move on to our next one. So I'm going to review again quickly. Genie concept is magic, unpredictable, unexplainable, only works for certain people. Where did it come from? Genesis 3, 3, and 4 from the devil. Genie concept takes many forms. One of them is price-free living. Another one is something for nothing. Another form of genie concept is the free lunch. Another form of genie concept is little in, little out, Lilo. And the next one I'm going to talk about is God himself as a genie. If you, when you think of God, if you conceive of him as a genie, that means you think that you can rub the lamp and get God to do what you want him to do. That means you think you can say some magic words, Sim Salabim, and the Lord just going to do what you want him to do. Uh, that's genie concept. That's not true. Alakazam! Shazam! You think you could just say some magic words and then the Lord's just going to wave his mighty hand and do all this stuff for you. That is a genie. That is not who God is. Okay? That's the wrong concept of God. That has messed up. I've seen some people lose people. People have died because you thought you could just run up to God and grab his coattail and rub the lamp. Or say some type of catchphrase. 
Like sometimes when people are praying, they say in Jesus' name. They just get real fancy with it because they think that's going to make the Lord answer you more. Mm -mm. That's genie concept. Okay? And then the second part of thinking about God as a genie is thinking that you have nothing to do with your walk or relationship with God. That is not the truth. That is all up to God and you don't have anything to do with it. That's when you hear, sometimes you hear people say, you know, whatever the Lord wants to do, whatever God's going to do, whatever the Lord's will, whatever, like you're some type of victim in life or like you don't have anything to do with it. That's incorrect, boys and girls. That is incorrect. That you don't have anything to do with your relationship with God, that you don't have anything to do with your walk with God, that it's all up to Him and you don't have a part, that's not true. Now, before I show you what is true, I want to show you how we got here. So I've gone over what genie concept is, where it comes from, and the different forms it takes. So the next section I'm dealing with here is, how do we get here in today's church? Because many of us as Western American Protestants have struggled and suffered and gone through a whole lot of things because of genie concept. Okay, so where did it come from? I'm going to show you. Two things happened in the 90s that got us to where we are now. Here's the first thing. The first thing that happened in the 90s was that secular people started adopting Christian language. They started saying, look, aren't we so blessed? Look at all my blessings. Aren't we so blessed? But they were living worldly lifestyles. So they were living lifestyles that did not line up with the word of God. They were not living in obedience to God's word. But they kept saying, look at all our blessings, look at all what we have, look at all this stuff. And the church looked at that, the saints looked at that and said, hmm. And it started getting in the saints' head that maybe we didn't have to live holy. Because remember, uh, when I say remember, I mean I'm assuming you're old enough. All up until the 90s, that wasn't true. All up until the 90s, there was a clear line, if you remember. There was a clear line between Christian stuff and non-Christian stuff. Between church stuff and not church stuff between sacred stuff and secular stuff. The line was very, very clear. And then in the 90s, that line started to blur because people started, you know, famous people started giving the impression and, and a lot of people in media started, they were living secular lifestyles, were saying, we're so blessed, look at all my blessings, but they weren't living according to the word of God. And the saints looked at that and said, hmm, and started to think, well, maybe we didn't have to live holy. Maybe we don't have to do all this stuff. And that's when things started to break down. That's the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened is something that I call the false prosperity gospel. Now, I'm going to deal uh, in another teaching about the prosperity gospel. Because there is no such thing as prosperity gospel. Because prosperity has always been a part of the gospel. But that's another teaching. But I do want to deal with the false prosperity gospel. Because it's very, very real. Amen. Oh, you have to go to work. Okay, God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. The, the false prosperity gospel came from an error called wrongly dividing the word of truth. Now, let me read you the scripture. It's 2 Timothy 2.15. Okay? 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, uh, let me read from the King James. Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Oh, Lord have mercy. If the Bible says that you need to rightly divide the word of truth, that means it's possible to wrongly divide it. In the Berean Study Bible, it says, 2 Timothy 2.15, make every effort to present yourself approved to God, an unashamed workman who accurately handles the word of truth. If the Bible has to tell you to accurately handle the word of truth, that means it's possible to inaccurately handle the word of truth. It means it's possible to wrongly divide the word of God, to have the wrong interpretation. That's entirely possible. And so that is what happened in the 90s with these kinds of phrases. People started saying things like, God says you're the head and not the tail. God says, well, you're above only and you're not beneath. That is not what the Bible says. I'm going to read to you what the Bible says in a minute, but that ain't what the Bible says. People started saying, well, God says you're the head and not the tail. 
And when you tell people that, you give them the idea that they don't have to do anything. And that is genie concept. That with no effort at all on your part, you're just going to kind of magically become the head and not the tail. You're just going to kind of magically be above only and not beneath. That is not what the Bible says. That is not what God said. But those are the two things that happened in the 90s. Is Secular people started using Christian language saying that look how blessed we are. And then the saints started feeling like that maybe we didn't have to live holy Christian lifestyles because they weren't and they were saying they were still blessed. Thing number one. And thing number two we wrongly divided the word of truth through the false prosperity gospel. And we started saying things like, God said you're the head and not the tail. And God said you're above and not beneath. So let me read to you what the word actually says. Okay? We're going to go to De Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 14. I'm reading from the King James Version. King James Version. Deuteronomy Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy is the fourth book in the Bible from the beginning. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, written by Moses, fourth book in the Bible, starting from the top. Deuteronomy chapter 28, starting in verse 1, says the following, And it shall come to pass, stop, right there God told you there's going to be a time element. It's not magic. There's going to be a time element involved. If... That means it's conditional. That means it doesn't just happen. And it shall come to pass if thou. So if God says if thou, that means something you got to do. And it shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently unto what? Unto the voice of the Lord thy God. So God done already told you that before you get to all these blessings you want to get to, it's going to take some time. It's conditional, and you got to listen to him. And not only do you listen to him, you got to listen to him diligently. That means you have to do it on a consistent basis, and it means you have to listen uh, with an ear to detail. Okay? If thou, you, shall hearken diligently unto who? The voice of the Lord thy God, not everybody that's talking to you, to observe and to do. That mean, why would it say observe and to do? That means you've got to put it on your calendar and you've got to watch yourself do it. You've got to write down your calendar, pay tithes this Sunday, and then Sunday, march yourself up. Or if they pass the offering plate, watch yourself, drop that money in the plate. You've got to write it down and you've got to do it. Observe to do all his commandments, O oh Lord. So the Bible says we've got to do everything God tells us to do, which I command thee this day that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. Now, do you see everything that happened before we got to the set thee on high part? <laughs> it shall come to pass, time element, if it's conditional. Thou, that means you got to do something. Thou shall hearken diligent. You've got to listen to the Lord on a regular basis with an eye towards detail. Unto the voice of the Lord thy God, you got to listen to him, not the devil, not other people, not demons, not your own flesh, not your own mind, not your spouse, not mom and them, not my cousin and them, not, not nene and them. You got to listen to the Lord, okay? To observe and to do. That means I got to write it on my calendar and be sure I do it. Go to church this Sunday, write it down, then get your hips up out the bed and go to church. Pay tithes this Sunday, write it down, then write that check for that 10% off the top and put it in the offering plate or at our church, we, we take it up to the front during worship. Okay? You got to write down uh, what God is telling you so you can be sure you do it, so you don't forget it. Okay? To observe and to do, then it says all his commandments. Uh. Some people are trying to get 100% blessing with 10% obedience. Good God Almighty up in here. <laughs> I said, some people are trying to get a 100% blessing with 10% obedience. That's not, <laughs> that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you got to do everything the Lord is telling you to do. You got to get into obedience. Okay? Which I, command thee this, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above, above all nations of the earth. Do you see everything that has to happen before you get set on high? Then I'm going to read you the blessings. Verse 2, 
And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, and thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in, blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee from before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thy hand unto. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself, as he has sworn unto thee that thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. And all the people shall see thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. The Lord shall make thee plenteous and goods, and the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of thy ground, and the land which the Lord swore to thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open to thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain into thy land in his season, and bless all the work of thy hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. Here it is, verse 13. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If... Thou, if that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, there it is, if you listen to the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them, and then verse 14 adds one more stipulation. Verse 14 says, and thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. Good, googly moogly. Look what the Bible actually says. But in the 90s, we started saying, well, God said you're the head and not the tail. That is not what God said. I just read you what God said. God said you've got to be listening on a regular basis, okay? And you've got to be in obedience. You've got to do what the Lord says do. And you've got to do everything the Lord is telling you to do. Then all the blessings line up. And then God says you've got to stay on that path. In other words, don't get distracted by other things other voices, other gods. He said, don't go aside. In other words, it's one thing to get on a path of obedience with God. It's another thing to stay. Because <laughs> sometimes there's going to be some trials and tribulations to try to knock you off that path. And there's always going to be temptations to try to knock you off the path. Okay? And the Lord says that when we go to the right hand or the left, we're listening to other gods besides him. That means we're in idolatry. And idolatry is spiritual adultery. Idolatry is when you're making love to another God besides Father, Jesus, and Holy Ghost. That's what idolatry is. You are spiritually having sex with another God besides Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the true and living God. You're cheating on God. So when you're listening to other voices that aren't Him, and you're following what they say, you're kidding, committing spiritual adultery on God, that's called idolatry. Look at that's what the Bible says. Not God says you're the head and not the tail, giving the implication that you don't have to do anything. That you're just that just because you're a Christian. Uh-uh. That's not the right uh, division of that word. And that's what people started saying in the 90s. That God said you're the head and not the tail, and giving people the idea that you didn't have to do anything. That you were just going to hear it, all them blessings I just read. You're just going to inherit them just because you're a Christian. Living any kind of way you want to, not listening to the Lord at all. Not in obedience at all. And that's not the truth. Okay? So, uh, I'm going to give you a hashtag because put, I put this on Twitter. And I'm going to put it on my Facebook Live. And uh, it's a hashtag we've seen before. But it's HBO. It's very simple. Hear, believe, and obey. That is your part. That is your part. One more time. That is your part. God is going to do the God stuff. He's going to release his word to accomplish his will. His spirit will supply the power. He will give us grace. He will give us forgiveness. He will give us the vision. Okay? He will open the door. He will go before us. He will give us the mighty warrior angels. He will give us angels of protection. He will do the God stuff, but we got to do something. And what we got to do is HBO, hear, believe, and obey. Now, the good news is, is that he gives us grace to do our part. He opens your ears so you can hear. That's by grace. He gives you a measure of faith. That's by grace so that you can believe. And then he gives you a will so you can obey. So he still gives us. See, it's still grace. Okay, it's not works. 
he still gives us the tools that we need to succeed because he wants us to succeed because he's a good God and he loves us. But we still have to use those tools properly. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. That even though we are under grace in the New Testament, we still have to do our part. And our part is HBO. Hear, believe, and obey. Then you get the blessing. And you have to keep obeying. And you have to keep obeying over time. And you have to be sure you keep that ear tuned to the voice of the Lord so you can obey with, with diligence, and with detail, and consistency. And then you have to be sure that you close that ear to distracting voices and do not walk in idolatry. And don't let somebody tempt you away from the Lord your God, the true lover of your soul. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the true lover of your soul, our triune God. Our Father, which gave us the Son, and the Son, which gave us life, gave his life for our life, and the Spirit of God that gives us his anointing and his grace and his presence. They're the ones that love us. And they tell us, don't get distracted by another voice tempting you to go over there and make love to another God and commit idolatry on the Lord your God. You see that? So it's our job to hear, believe, and obey. Okay, I'm going to do a quick review, and then we're going to do some deliverance. And then I'm going to release a prophetic word and we'll be done for the night. So, uh, from the top, uh, this is a teaching, PDT, NMG, PDT is me, Prophet David Taylor. NMG is no more genies. Okay, we're going to get rid of genie concept. I'm coming on uh, the second Thursday of every month. So I won't be on again until the second Thursday of May for this teaching. I'm coming on... 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on the second Thursday of every month. Okay? The reason we have to do the teaching is because we must break up the fallow ground. We have to get the demons out, the unclean spirits, the hardness of heart, the wrong things that we've been carrying in our heart and our mind so we can receive first. Uh, genie concept is if you believe that God and his kingdom is magic, that it's unexplainable, that it's unpredictable, and it only works for certain people. All that is wrong. Where did genie concept come from? It came from the devil in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, 3 through 4. When the devil convinced the woman she could make a choice and not get a consequence. And she could choose death and not get death. And then um, genie concept takes many forms. One of the forms of genie concept we talked about price-free living. And that's not true. I told you about cost. Cost you to attain, maintain, and retain. But if you're operating on genie concept, you believe in price-free living. That's how people uh, fall for that, you know, that African scam. But that's, that's uh, something for nothing. I'll get there in a minute. Or that's how people get catfished. Or that's the free lunch. So genie concept takes many forms. Price-free living, um, which isn't true. It costs you to attain, maintain, and retain. Something for nothing. That's a Nigerian email scam where some... Uh, Nigerian prince has $10 million that they're just going to give you. <laughs> they just going to give you $10 million and people fall for it all the time. Uh, the free lunch, that's when people get catfished, when you believe someone is living this fabulous life and they just want you in it. <laughs> they travel all over the world and they have all this money and they're, they're nice looking and they have all these options and all they want to do is take you on these expensive vacations. And you find out that the person on the other end of that catfish and online wasn't none of what they say. That's because you believe they're a free lunch. You believe that somebody's going to put all that stuff together and give it to you for nothing, for free. So, uh, price free living, something for nothing, the free lunch. Lilo, which is little in, little out. When you come to church three times a year and you give God $15 and you think you're going to reap a, a million dollar harvest. Mm -mm. And then God himself as a genie. Where you think you just have to rub him the right way or say the magic words. And also where you think that you have no part in it. Okay? All that is wrong. And our part is to HBO. Hear, believe, and obey. Okay? So right now we're going to move into deliverance. And then I'm going to release a prophetic word, a new spirit. And then those of you that are still tuning in, if you still have a prayer request, we'll go with a prayer request. So right now in the name of Jesus. The demons are subject to us in the name of Jesus. So in the name of Jesus, I cast out any version of genie concept. I cast it out of my own heart. <clears throat> I cough it out. I breathe it out. Anything that's in me that's not like God, that's not of the truth, I cast it out. And I rebuke the spirit of genie concept. I rebuke the spirit of price-free living. 
I rebuke the spirit of the free lunch, something for nothing. I rebuke the spirit of little in, little out. I rebuke anything that makes you think you can make a choice and not get a consequence, that you can choose death and not get death. I command you to come out of everybody that's listening in Jesus' name. And those of you that are listening, if you feel something stirring, cough it out. Cough. <coughs> cough it out. Cough it out of your spirit. Breathe that out. No longer operate in genie concept because the spirits are subject to us in the name of Jesus. And I command you to come out. I command you to come out and afflict the people of God no more. So if you feel something stirring inside of you, cough it out. Get rid of that spirit. Break that spirit off of you. We break the power of genie concept. We break the power of something for nothing. We break the power of little in, lot out. We break the power of the free lunch. We break the power of price-free price free living because you are alive from the devil. Started in, started in the Garden of Eden. We rebuke you in the name of Jesus and we cast you out. And you have no control over us, no power over us, no authority over us. In the name of Jesus, it is done and it is so. Amen. That's the deliverance portion. Now we're going to go to the prophetic portion. And I'm going to, through the Holy Spirit, release, release unto you. So let me pray in tongues, stir myself up. Okay, I see you. Let me pray in tongues, stir myself up. When you pray in tongues, you charge your spirit with your heavenly language. Yes, God says, oh, my people, it's time for you to be free, all the way free. For where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I died on Calvary to set you free from all the works of darkness, from every work of the devil. No longer do you have to walk in darkness and believe wrong things. But now you can believe the truth of my rightly divided word and walk in the fullness of my blessing. So in the name of Jesus, I release unto you a spirit of rightly dividing the word of truth. I release unto you a spirit of hear, believe, obey. I release unto you a spirit of diligence where you will hear the voice of God on a regular basis. You will believe the voice of God on a regular basis. You will obey the voice of God on a regular basis. I release unto you the spirit of hear, believe, obey. And as you begin to walk in hear, believe, obey, you will see the blessings begin to manifest as never before, says the spirit of the living God. Amen, amen, amen. All right. Now, someone had a prayer request. I believe you said you, uh, had, uh, you wanted a word for your benefits and you have a marriage situation. Okay, so uh, let me pray, and then I'll release whatever the Holy Ghost gives me. But we come to you praying on behalf of this VA situation, oh God, and we pray on behalf of this marriage situation, oh God, you know about it, you know all about it. So let your word and your will be known, oh God. Okay, God says to you, you need to believe for deliverance. You need to believe that your benefits will come through. You need to believe that God is going to open the door and that if someone has broken their covenant with you, God is going to give you justice. God himself is going to be a swift witness against oath breakers. And when we commit adultery, we have broken our oath because we stood before God and took vows. And if we have broken those vows, God is going to be a swift witness against oath breakers. And God is going to be a swift witness against adulterers. And God will vindicate you and deliver you from that situation. But you must believe it. You must believe that your God will open the door to make sure your benefits are right. You must believe that if you have been wronged and there has been infidelity, that God will be a swift witness against adulterers and God will be a swift witness against oath breakers to deliver you and when he does deliver you and he will then be sure to give him all the glory in Jesus name amen all right so that's what you need to do you need to believe that God is going to open the door for those benefits to get right and you need to believe that God's going to be a swift witness against uh, someone that has broken their vows against you okay all right. Well, God bless you. This has been a wonderful evening. I've really enjoyed this time with you. I've really enjoyed this teaching. Uh, again, I'm going to be on here the second Thursday night of every month. I'm going to continue to teach on Genie Concept because we need much deliverance from it. I'm going to teach some more. Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to teach some more on faith. 
and what faith is. I didn't have time to get it tonight, get to it tonight, and what faith really is and what it's not, and how it works. Because again, uh, it's NMG, no more genies. We're moving away from genie concept, and we're moving into the word of truth. So thank you so much for tuning in. For those of you that watch the broadcast later, thank you so much. Uh, I believe that this is the word of God coming forth to edify his body, and I'm happy to be a part of it. I feel blessed and honored to be used of God, because God don't need me. God don't need none of us. God gives us an opportunity to be a part of his kingdom and to be used to uh, spread his kingdom and work in his vineyard. But it's an opportunity. And if you slap his hand away, if you slap his hand away, he's going to give your kingdom and your opportunity to somebody else. Because God don't need you. And God don't need me. It's an opportunity. That's why I'm so grateful. I'm grateful to be a part of God's kingdom. I'm grateful to be a prophet of God. I'm grateful to share what the Holy Ghost gives me with you. And I'm grateful for those of you that are receiving and believing and being edified by the word. All right? God bless you. We're going to close out with prayer. Thank you, God, for this night. Thank you for your mighty word. Thank you for your prophetic word. Thank you for your rightly divided word. Thank you, O oh God, for the spirit of truth. And we just want to ask to continue to fill our hearts and minds with your word. Because now we know we need to tune to your voice, O oh God, and listen to you with detail. And listen to you diligently. And be sure to observe to do everything you're telling us to do, O oh God. So thank you for the new spirit of hear, believe, and obey. And from this day forward, O oh God, we're going to walk in that new spirit so we can hear you, believe you, and obey you. And begin to walk in the level of blessing that you die to give us. We thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all. That's it for tonight. Thank you so much. I will see you this time next month on the second Thursday. God bless. Mm -mm, mm -mm.